Olá pessoal, tudo bem? Seguimos com mais uma entrevista internacional e dessa vez um convidado muito especial, professor David Wilkins, vice-reitor da Harvard Law School, da Faculdade de Direito de Harvard e coordenador do CLP, o Center on the Legal Profession. David, que também é o coordenador de dois dos principais cursos de educação executiva da Harvard Law School, que é o Leadership in Law Firms e o Leadership in Corporate Council, que nós vamos falar um pouco mais sobre esses dois programas nessa entrevista de hoje. Eu vou agora, então, endereçar as perguntas em inglês para ele. David, thank you so much for your time. I know that it's a very difficult moment for all of us. We are now facing a very, a very hard challenge uh, worldwide. So, uh, and I think Brazil and US are in the same time regarding the, the outbreak. Now, China is a little bit more advanced than Europe, and now it's our time to face this, this challenge. So, and uh, the first question that I'd like to ask to you is, Uh, how Harvard is dealing with the with the COVID-19 outbreak? What what were the measures uh, adopted? How how are you dealing with this? So first, let me just say to your listeners, bom dia, and uh, I'm sorry, no fala português uh, except for uh, caipirinha and feijoada and the other imported words. So yes, I will be doing this in in English, but it's a great pleasure to be, to be speaking to people in Brazil. Uh, as uh, Bruno knows, uh, I love Brazil. I've been coming to Brazil ever since the very first time in 1971, which was before Bruno was born. Uh, and I've been back uh, many times, uh, most recently in conjunction with a book that we wrote on the Brazilian legal profession in the age of globalization and maybe Bruno when you post this you could put a link to where people uh, can find the book. Um, in answer to your question, yes we are uh, maybe even a little bit uh, in front of Brazil in terms of uh, how the uh, COVID virus uh, effect is affecting us. Uh, so Harvard uh, shut down completely Uh, about uh, now, I think almost two weeks ago, uh, canceled all in-person classes, sent all of our students, most of whom live in the area or live on campus, they're all been sent home. And our all of our classes are now being taught online. So I just actually, a few days ago, had my first online class. Um, Sadly, uh, this is going to now extend through the end of this school year. So our graduation has been canceled, uh, which is one of the most joyous occasions for students and faculty and their parents. Uh, they hope to perhaps do something online or something perhaps in the fall, but in terms of the normal graduation, that's been canceled. Uh, and with respect to the Center on the Legal Profession and uh, Harvard Law School's executive education programs, which I also uh, started, uh, as Bruno knows, we typically run several programs, particularly this is a very busy time for us, including our courses on leadership in law firms, where we have 50 uh, or so leaders from around the world, including Brazil, including Bruno and many other uh, distinguished Brazilian lawyers. Uh, we run a course called Leadership in Corporate Council, where we also have about 50 general councils from again all around the world, including Brazil. And sadly, all of that has been canceled through the end of June. So uh, as of now, we won't have any new programs uh, until the fall. Okay, so uh, you, you, you talk uh, about the, the programs on, of the leadership law firms and the leadership in corporate council. I had the great opportunity to attend uh, this program, the leadership in law firms in 2015. It was a great moment for me in my, in my education. Uh, and I learned, I learned a lot on, on this program. And regarding uh, this special moment that we're living, uh, what are the lessons that these programs that you coordinate uh, can gives us, uh, uh, can, help, can help us to navigate through this, through this new time, let's say like that, in terms of online, online life, like home office, and uh, how we can motivate our team, you know, things like that. Well, first and foremost, Bruno, 
when you have a, a crisis of this kind, and this is a, a new crisis for all of us, uh, that in the fundamental uh, respect, it comes down to leadership. Uh, and it comes down to leadership starting from the top. Uh, so in our classes where the one you were in, you were there because you are a leader of your own law firm. Um, we have leaders in law firms from, you know, very small firms to firms that are the biggest in the world. And those leaders have to set the tone uh, about how uh, important the crisis is, but also how important it is for the firm or the organization to stay together and to maintain the importance of the culture of the organization. And uh, we're already seeing some of the best organizations uh, around the world trying to do that. So for example, uh, I, uh, you know the law firm of Paul Weiss Rifkin, one of the most important uh, law firms in New York City, uh, particularly world famous for its litigation, but uh, well known for many other practices as well. Uh, Brad Karp is the managing partner of Paul Weiss, and he's on the advisory board of the Center on the Legal Profession, and I know him quite well, and uh, he's a really uh, excellent leader. And he just mobilized an effort in his law firm to uh, mobilize pro bono uh, resources for individuals and small businesses who are facing the crisis. As you probably know here in uh, Boston, all businesses are shut down. Yeah. and particularly restaurants and bars and all sorts of small organizations, which means that literally millions of people in the United States are now out of work and millions of businesses are now uh, faced with the prospect of how to pay the rent and how to pay the utility bills and the phone bills. Paul Weiss uh, put out a call to its lawyers saying we would like you to volunteer to help uh, um, help digest and, uh, and uh, uh, uncover all of the government programs and initiatives that might be there to help small businesses and individuals. Four, more than 400 lawyers volunteered, and they now have a website uh, called, I think it's called the Coronavirus Website or something like that under Paul Weiss, in which you, any person can click on that website and find out what are the government programs in your state or a city that might be there to help you as a bartender or a waiter or waitress or a owner of a small uh, business uh, to help get access to government resources. That's doing two things. One is it's you know providing an important public service, but it's also reaffirming the values of the organization, saying that yes, of course, we're an organization to make money and to provide high-end legal services, but we're also part of a public profession. It's also getting the lawyers to work together, even though they're working from home. Uh, so that's just one example of, I think, many ways in which the best organizations are trying to uh, show leadership from the top so Brad wrote a long uh, message to the legal profession on behalf of Paul Weiss, saying what Paul Weiss was doing, but also bringing people together in the organization. Um, I'll just tell you one other thing, but also that it's a cautionary note. Uh, many of the law firms are publishing uh, things and putting out resources for their clients about how businesses, uh, you know, big companies can respond to the coronavirus conference and they're having webinars and they're sending out newsletters. That's a good thing to connect, but they're not doing the second step or maybe the first step, which is asking their clients what they need and asking their clients how they can help. 
So instead, they're inviting their clients to webinars that the clients don't have time to watch. They're sending them papers they don't have time to read instead of saying, how can we be there for you? That's another way in which law firms can show leadership and connections to their clients by actually asking their clients what they need in this time. Very good. And uh, well, it's, a, it's indeed a new time and we are using a lot of technology. So as we are doing right now uh, through, through the Zoom, right? To, to record this, this interview, otherwise it would be possible only by phone maybe. And so we have a, a, a very uh, interesting challenge in Brazil because most of the lawyers don't have the right equipment at home, you know, to use the internet. They don't have a good internet. They don't have printers. They don't have, you know, they don't know how to, to organize a home office, for example. So this is one of the big challenges uh, for like 90% of the lawyers in Brazil They're, that run very, very small uh, firms or they don't have firms e uh, at all. They are just uh, individual lawyers. So that's the, 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 one of the problems. So how do you see the future of the legal profession after this outbreak? So how this outbreak is changing the way we practice law? So when uh, this whole thing was unfolding at Harvard, and it happened, I'm sure, just as in Brazil, very rapidly. I mean, one day we were there, business as usual, had our students, had our classes, and then within three or four days, everything was shut down. And uh, when it began to happen, I was actually there with a senior fellow from the Center on the Legal Profession, who I think you may have met, Bruno. Uh, his name is Ron Dolan. He is a very unique guy because he was one of the original people at Google. Mm -hmm. he, was totally. as a, he was employee number 49 at Google. So he's an engineer, brilliant engineer. Uh, but after uh, Google went public and he did very well, uh, he then decided he would go to law school. So he got a full three-year JD degree from the University of California at Hastings. So he's one of the few people who is qualified both in technology at the highest levels, but also a fully qualified lawyer. And he worked in uh, Wilson Sonsini. Uh, and he is an expert at the intersection of technology and law. And he's, he was teaching a course that I brought him to Harvard to teach called Law 2.0 which was all about the way in which technology is going to change legal practice. And as soon as Harvard said that they were going to all remote learning, he said this thing, which I think is very, very important for us to recognize. He said, this is going to end up changing fundamentally the way that lawyers and legal academics uh, practice or teach and deal with technology because it's going to force all of us uh, not just the people who like technology or who are good at it but it's going to force everyone to actually get their hands dirty working with these tools like zoom where you and i are working and it's going to sh show them three things one the technology is not as scary as they thought it was, or even as expensive as they thought they was. So for all those lawyers in Brazil, if they have a laptop computer and they have an internet connection, they could be doing exactly what you and I are doing, meaning Zoom is basically a software that they can download from the internet for basically for free. Mm -hmm. And they can get access to video conferencing, which in a way used to be really expensive. You used to have special equipment and a whole setup in your office. Now you run it from your laptop or frankly from your phone. Second, they'll begin to see that technology allows people to do things that would be much more difficult or impossible to do in person. So for example, in our classroom teaching, uh, I teach a seminar. There are 20 different students in the seminar. On the Zoom platform, 
I can instantly put the 20 students into five working groups of four people by pushing a button. They can then talk amongst themselves for 10 minutes and all come back together using a virtual whiteboard that's on their screen to answer questions, think together, and then we can all come back together and share our ideas. To do that in a real classroom, I'd have to have five other classrooms that I could send people out in or provide people with material. There's just a way in which you could begin to do things that would be much harder to do if you were actually in person. And we're gonna realize that. That's the second part. The third part is, there are a lot of frustrating things about this technology. And people will begin to say, I wish it could do this, or I wish it could do that. Well, that's what software developments need to hear, because then what they're gonna do is improve the technology. And because people are already used to using it, if it gets better, they'll use it more. And I think now that law firms realize that you could have a pretty good virtual meeting mm -hmm. with you in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro and me in Boston, that we won't always put off having a meeting until we can physically be together. I hope you'll still invite me to Rio because it's the most beautiful city oh. in the world and I, <laughs> I certainly would want to, <laughs> to come. But but we don't have to be together to collaborate effectively. And I think that is going to change the way that lawyers think about the way they practice law, even ordinary lawyers, because a lot of the technology is not expensive anymore. That's true, that's true. One of the most uh, interesting things that happened in the, like last week, uh, we had the first a virtual session at the Brazilian Senate, and they voted the presidential decree for public calamity. And the, the interesting thing is that one of the senators was infected by COVID-19, and he participated. This, this would be, it would be impossible if, if it was a physical meeting, for yes. obvious reasons, but he could And I think we're going to find lots of ways in which things that would be impossible or difficult to do in person are much easier to do online. Let me just say this also though, Bruno, I think we'll also appreciate those things that are better to be done in person. That is, I think it will make us treasure more the times where we are actually together sharing a meal, you know, seeing your parents or my parents where we cannot see them now because we're worried about, you know, spreading the virus. Um, I think there'll be, it'll be both ways. That is, we'll see things that we can do in technology that we should do in technology that will improve what we're doing, but we'll also value and treasure even more the things that we do in a face-to-face. -face. That's, that's really true, that's really true. Dave, the last question, uh, what is your message for not only the lawyers, but also for the law students who are facing uh, these new moments of online classes and physical classes? And what is our message to, to everybody? So uh, I thank you very much for giving me that opportunity to, to speak to the students in Brazil. Again, I, I believe that I know Brazil has had many challenges in the last few years, but I always have believed in Brazil and I believe in Brazil's future. But that future belongs not to people like you, me, or even people like you, and you're a lot younger than me, Bruno, uh, but it belongs to the, the, the law students and the young people. Uh, so I'll say three things to them. One, yes, there's going to be you know, a, a lot of displacement and a lot of pain in the near future. Meaning, I think that this is going to prompt something that looks like a, a recession pretty much around the world in the near term. Mm -hmm. But second, 
people are going to need lawyers more than ever because these issues uh, raise, you know, how to deal with this new reality raises a huge number of new and interesting and important legal questions, you know, from how to interpret uh, contracts and force majeure clauses yeah. all the way to uh, how to uh, reimagine our economy in a way that allows it to exist in an age in which global pandemics will continue to happen. Uh, you know, how to uh, create public private partnerships, uh, you know, where, because governments can't handle this without the private sector, but the private sector also needs the coordination of government. That's uh, going to involve new legal mechanisms and new institutions. Um, whatever kind of lawyer you are, whether you are a lawyer for the biggest, most important uh, companies and institutions, or a lawyer in the public sector, or a lawyer who's dealing with individuals who want to know what kind of employment relief they could get, or when, you know, whether they've been laid off unfairly, or lots of other things that are gonna come from this, the world is going to need lawyers more than ever. That's the second part. And the last part is, there'll be no better lawyers to respond to these new challenges than the young people coming out of law school today. We just were talking about technology. Well, for me and you to figure out how to use something like Zoom is a challenge. For these kids, they were born digital. They, they lived their whole lives in a digital world. I, I had a long talk. One of the best things about this crisis is I'm spending many, many hours at home with my son and occasionally he gets so bored he has to talk to me. And we had a two hour discussion about all the social media platforms and all the ways in which he interacts with his friends and how those platforms and those ways of connecting from Snapchat to Instagram to YouTube can actually be a model for the way in which we're going to have to be connecting and interacting with each other moving into the, into the future. And lawyers are a part of that future. So I would say to the young people, take what you know about how to exist in the digital world and how to interact and how to build community and how to show humanity in that world and help to teach your your parents or your seniors in the law firms or in the legal organizations or in government because we need to listen to the young people as much as we can about how to navigate this new environment. Yeah, David, thank you so much for this interview. Thank you so much for your time. I know that it's a hard time for you. We are giving a lot of classes online. So thanks so much for give a little bit of your time uh, for us and to see your perspective about this, this new time that we are, we are facing. Okay, my friend, thank you so much. And I will stop the, our recording now. Okay, obrigado. <laughs>